welcome to Wigan Fan TV. Um, I'm joined tonight by um, sports editor of the Wigan Observer and the Wigan Evening Post, uh, Phil Wilkinson. Phil, thank you for joining me tonight. No problem, mate. Anytime. Um, Phil, what the? I guess what the plan tonight was basically um, just to talk about everything Wigan, everything rugby league. Look back at the um, the league game from the weekend and, and answer any questions that that people have got. We've got a few questions that have come through already. I think we've got four <laughs> questions from, from people during the day that we'll uh, we'll throw at you at some point. We'll, we'll start with the um, with the league game from from the weekend, Phil. What did? I mean, it's hard to get a, a good gauge. It was a friendly. Obviously, chopping and changing. I think Wigan had ended up with twenty using twenty three, twenty four players during during the game. What did you make of it? Were you impressed by by what you saw from the first team? I was cold. <laughs> it was the <laughs> coldest I've been for years. Um, I thought it was expensive too for a friendly, wasn't it? Twenty pound a ticket. Yeah. I thought it was ridiculous. That to be quite honest, um, I, I went. Wigan never normally do well in friendlies, do they? Especially that league game. You know, I think we've only won one of the previous five. Usually with a, a weaker side, it must be said. And I went with that logic that if you don't really read too much into the defeats and the performances where we don't show up, you can't really take too much when they win. And when we do show up, but, but having said all of that, I thought there were a couple of things which, if nothing else, it just reassured me. One was a kicking game. Uh, not necessarily goal kicking. I know mean, Sam, Sam kicked um, I think two from three, and then he was off for the last one. But it was more the, the place kicking, his long kicks as well as George Williams's short kicks. I thought they went well in tandem together. And also a prop. Um, it wasn't a day, was it really, for anyone to really properly catch the eye? But Gabriel Hamlin had a pretty good go at it. Yeah. Uh, I thought he went well. Um, and Roman Navarre, I thought he had a couple of good carries. I love the way from a dropout he gets a ball. He just runs full speed ahead. And I think just the fact that those two are there and Ben Flo is back fit, um, I think it's just going to really amp up that competition for prop spots. That was a problem last year. I mean, we yeah. talk about Frank Paul and Lewis Allen not being in good form last season. He played every single game. Sean Wayne has yeah. always had that ethos, hasn't he? If you're not playing well, you don't play. I think his hand was going to be forced last year with the props. He, so he had props who weren't playing particularly well, who he had to play. And I think, you know, yeah. if... if if we're going to buy the theory that competition makes players play better, then presumably it works the other way too, and complacency probably just makes them drop off a bit. Yeah, I think it's you know it, it is a friendly, but I think it's certainly a game where people could impress. And I think if Gabe Hamlin could have picked that performance, he, he would have picked that finished off with a try, of mm -hmm. course. And he just yeah. looks. I, I, he's just. I mean, it, I, I guess he's going to play a combination between the front row and, and thirteen, maybe interchanging with blockers at some point. He's a strange shape, though, isn't he? Yeah, he's probably <laughs> the closest to Ben Flower of all yeah. of them. You know, I mean, he's he's compact, a bit barrel chested. I guess he's fast twitch, though, isn't he? I like that. Um, the other thing I thought was interesting, and I thought they might do this, was you got an inkling of how we're going to run the halfbacks this year because he started with uh, Sam Tompkins at fullback, Powell and Williams in the halves, and Tommy at hooker. But instead of having a bench hooker on, well, they had a big, big bench, but. The, the, the player they brought on was Morgan Escaray um, when Lula White came off. And then, of course, you saw Tonkin shift to the halves, Powell shift to Hooker. They've done that before. If you remember 2011 when Brett Finch came in and they already had Deacon and Lula White, they didn't affect the fullback spot, but we put a halfback on the bench and then one of them moved yeah. to Hooker and, and rotated it that way around. So it's not completely new. And I think it's good. I thought it was good having Escaray and Sam on the pitch together. I thought it was yeah. good seeing Escaray fresh as well, running at players after half an hour. I think that might be a move that works well for them. Yeah, I think that's, we've had on the last five shows that we've done about this, we've, we've had every different theory about how we're going to go on the line-up in, in 2018. And, yeah. Um, you know, it, I think that mystery isn't as much of a mystery anymore. I think what you said is absolutely right. It is that almost Paul Deacon role now that, that we've gone back to uh, and having that freshness from, from Escobar off the bench. My only concern, and I'd be interested to get your thoughts on this, and again, it's you know, 20 minutes of a game, is how that right edge looks with Sam defending Sam Tompkins defending in the line rather than Sam Powell. Obviously, we conceded two tries from when Sam was, was moved up to six or seven. How do you think he'll get on with that? And do you think that's somewhere that um, opposition's uh, opposition sides might exploit us? Yeah, defending in the line. It's a good point. It's one to watch, isn't it? Um, uh, Dan Sargentson put his hand up for at least one of those tries. Well, I mean, he uh, he yeah. just uh, completely admitted that he, he made a misread. Uh, got a facial injury in the process as well. I mean, he, he probably didn't have a... If we talk about game handling, Seth and him, well, Dan Sargentson probably had a, an uncomfortable 
first game back in Britain. But I mean, he has been out for a while, so you cut him a little bit of slack, I guess. Um, the good thing is about that right side where you talk about Sam defending, you're going to have John Bateman on that side, Dan Sargentson, yeah. Tom Davis. But not, it's not a, you know, it's not an unphysical edge, is it? So it, it should be okay in that sense. Uh, but we're talking about those halves. I tell you who I'd love to see mix it up is Jake Shorrocks. I was made up. He got yeah. that try. I mean, he, he's had a horrible eleven months out, but we forget because of that. Just how much progress he was making at the end of 2016. He was only Sean O'Loughlin's remarkable recovery that, that, that forced him out of that grand final side. Yeah. And he was playing a big part in that, wasn't he? I remember that game at Warrington, that comeback game when was it Ben Flower had been sent off. Jake yeah, Shorrocks he, played he, he the big role in that. And he was, of that game. You, you could see him improving week to week. And he's obviously a natural halfback who's been playing a bit of a bench hooker. And he's a good kicker as well. He's a good goal kicker as well. I, um, yeah. I'd love to see him, probably not now, Probably not for a couple of months, but once he's got his fitness back, his sharpness back, I'd love to see him kick on and and, and really compete for a spot among all of us players we've just talked about. Yeah, I think, again, this is something that we've spoke about um, at length over the past few few shows, but do you think that the, the, Mickey Mark moving on, Gelly moving on, do you think that what this does now for this halfback situation almost gives a clearer path for the likes of Jake Shorts and Josh Ganton to, to have a shot at getting in the first team and making those positions if not a bench position for this this season their own yeah it does although interestingly speaking to the Catalan journalist he was suggesting that Mickey Matt might play a bit of a 13 role you know like um I guess a bit like Jason Batiri does over there and and maybe that was the way Mickey Matt could have gone if he'd have stayed at Wigan we, I think would be foolish yeah. to expect or Lachlan to play every single game every every week and and, and probably maybe beyond this year maybe not um yeah, I can't say I'm completely at peace with the decision to let Mickey Mack leave. I do understand the reasons for it, and I guess, and I, but but I know why some people would be um, would be baffled because I certainly was. I thought it was a a strange one. Having having had it explained, I do understand the reasons for it, the logic for it. But um, I, I, I do hope, for Wigan's sake, really, um, Thomas Lulawai really makes a fist of this of this number nine shirt and uh, and, and has a good run. Yeah, I mean, that, that's a nice little segue into something that, that again, we've spoken about at, at length. And when I spoke to Steve Mascord last week, we, we spoke about the interview that, that you did yourself with, with Chris Radlinski. How did you find that? How did you find Chris? Was he in good spirits ahead of the season? Yeah, he was. I was really, I wanted to speak to Ian Lennigan. I know he's been uh, busy involved in all of these Super League restructures. Um and, and I, <laughs> Chris wasn't the second choice, but I was I was pleased that he agreed to do it. And I, I'll be honest, I was surprised he was as uh, surprised is probably the wrong word, but I, I was pleased that he was as candid as he was. I think even if you disagreed with what he said, you could understand the logic of it. And it's always hard. I always I, I, I do cut them a bit of slack on signings because you never know the figures involved. It, yeah. You know, I mean, uh, you know, look, if, like if Dan Sargentson is on. 60 grand i would say that's a pretty good move if dan sargentson's on 180 grand i'd say it's not a good move so yeah. it, it's a tough one to make a call on some of these players you know and uh, you, obviously they can't disclose figures and i don't know these figures um although you, you can probably presume when morgan Esquire resigned on a three-year deal he was on uh, he's on for a lot more than the one yeah. year he arrived on you know so i can understand the logic of, of the salary cap uh being taken up even though we can have not recruited well, recruited anyone really. I mean, Gabe Hamlin's just been a, a replacement for a couple of the players who've departed. I mean, that's probably a part of the game that, that us as fans and, and well, a lot of people just can't appreciate is, is salary cap management. I mean, it must be such yeah. a difficult job, particularly when you're producing quality that to retain that quality, you've got to increase the wage naturally. And, you know, that means that it, people have got to leave. It was explained to me that up until they get to about 27, 28 years old, the contracts normally increase year on year. After that point, that's normally when you can trim some off year on year. But so when we're going to have got a lot of young players, homegrown players, I mean, nobody would expect Oliver Gildart to be on the contract now that he was on three years ago. It would yeah. be laughable, but of course, because we see an academy product coming into the side, it probably just goes back to the fact that when you retain players, it doesn't generate that excitement, does it? The recruiting players does, you know? And I think that's yeah. that, that's probably a, a little bit of a why there's been a, a, a negativity going into this new season from Wigan's point of view, because they've not had that headline grabbing, you know, player coming in and they've lost Mickey McLaurin as well. Yeah, I think 
that's probably a way to look at it, isn't it? That we retain George Williams. We've still yeah. got the likes of John Bateman, you know, attracting a lot of NRL interest. You know, we've got to perhaps view it as a as a year of retention rather than a year of, of, of top signings. Yeah, I mean, I still think they've got the quality in there, though. I mean, despite the way that last season finished, I, I did a little experiment with a couple of the guys at work, and, and we went through every position, and I said to them, name three players in Super League who are better than any one of Wiggins in those positions. So, for example, fullback. I don't think you can name three fullbacks better than Esker Ray or Tompkins. Uh, wing, you could probably make a case for McGillivray, maybe one or two others, but you, you get into Joe Burgess pretty quickly. Uh, yeah. You know, centre, I mean, I can't think of three centres better than Oliver Gildart, certainly if you factor into it, his potential. Halfback, it was probably only, a, even a prop forward, I thought I could easily name more than three props. But then it wasn't, I wasn't far down the list before I mentioned Ben Flower. And of course, we forget that he was out of the squad from, well, for most of last year, wasn't it? It was early May when he had an injury. So they, they do have the quality in that squad. I just think they need a bit of, a, a bit of a change to the way they play and a bit of a bit of fortune as well this year. I mean, they lined up on on Sunday one to twelve. Obviously, Lockers was was rested, but that, I mean that's going to be the first time in a long time going into a season with pretty much everybody, bar I guess John Bateman fit, and um, potentially for that for that game at Salford. So it's it start it starts off well. Whether we keep that way in terms of injuries, obviously only, yeah. only time will tell, and, and hopefully. Um, Hopefully we will do. We'll pick up a couple of these questions to, to throw at you, uh, Phil. Um, just to, uh, I mean, again, this is this is from from John Harley. He's got a picture of Harley Asina, I think that is is his profile picture. Uh, pretty much links into to what we were saying, and, and obviously you've spoken to to Chris Radlinski about this. But he says, do you think the halfback hooker situation this year is more a case of mismanagement from Wigan rather than what they intended, i.e., letting Mickey Matt go? Do you think? This was always their intention of where they're at now. I thought the most interesting thing about the Mickey Mack cycle, which Chris Rubinsky said in that interview, uh, which is still available on Wigan today, by the way. <laughs> I thought the most interesting bit about it was um, was that he said that they didn't instigate the move. It was Mickey Mack's agent who got in touch with them and said he wants to go to try his hand in the NRL. I think it was only the fact that Canberra came in with a pretty low offer for a one-year deal as well. Canberra was going to say, you can come over here, play for a year, and then use it as a, I guess, a shop window to get another NRL gig. Um, yeah. Mickey Mack, probably 30 years old after the injuries he's had, he probably went for the safer option. And as he says himself, he didn't want to leave his dogs for so long, um, <laughs> yeah. which I thought was kind of very candid and cute. Uh, yeah, so I suppose when Mickey Mack's made that initial approach, but he's looking elsewhere, then it got Wigan thinking about it. They were under pressure salary cap-wise. Again, we, we mentioned before we don't know the figures involved, but we can probably guess that Mick is one of the better earners at the club. Uh, I wouldn't say it was mismanagement, though, but I do think it's a calculated risk, and I think it might be one of them which, you know, even though they'd love Sam Powell, even though they've got the other options there, I, I do think it might be one of them which it, it takes a little while to convince everyone that it was the right move. Yeah, I guess the end of the season is, is the time to, to probably answer that question, but... Like we said before, it, it does create a pathway for some really talented there, and exciting youngsters. There aren't many players who come back and bite them either, though, and I, I do wonder whether this might be the one. I just think Mickey Mack will be the great signing at Catalan, who we've had that soft underbelly, and I just think Mickey Mack's a player that they need that will really tackle that issue. Yeah, I mean, that, they've got an awesome sort of middle unit now, of Greg Bird yeah. and Greg Greg Bird and, and Mickey Mack. I don't think many um, many players will fancy running at them at any point during the year. Um, thanks, John, for that for that question. Move on to to Jeff's question. Um, how do you think the the news today regarding the potential takeover of Wigan Athletic could in, have an impact on the Warriors? I, I don't think it will at all. Um, I've spoken to people at the Warriors. The contract they have in terms of a DW stadium is 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 well, I wouldn't say water, but yeah, watertight. They're confident that it, it, their contract. The lease with the DW Stadium isn't affected. Uh, they'll carry on as stable mates of Wigan Athletic at the DW. It's complicated because of the ownership, because Wigan, um, Wigan Football, we, the holding company owns 85% of the stadium, the council owns 15%, but the holding company is pretty much Wigan Athletic, you know, because of the figures yeah. involved. So this company, that this consortium that's buying Wigan Athletic, will effectively take control of the stadium. But Wigan Warriors still have this uh, this agreement in place. 
I've been on Companies House files and it, I can't get to the bottom of how long this lease is for. On Wigan Football, on the holding company's files, it says it's till 2025, but with a renewable lease. On Wigan Warriors file, uh, accounts, it says it's a, it's a 25 year renewable lease, so it's 25 years from now. Um, whichever it is, Wigan is certainly going to be, it seems I mean, to that, be staying at the DW Stadium. And it, do you know what? It, it, it almost would seem stupid, even if he wanted to get rid of the Warriors. I, I, I couldn't see the logic in it because they've got a big stadium there. They, they, they're not making money. They need to make money. Obviously, having Warriors there, having somebody playing 15, 16 games a year there, it makes yeah. the stadium money. So it's it's sensible, even if he didn't want them there. It ties in with, with pretty much, I guess, the same question that Emma Brown has, has asked here is, um, do you ever think Wigan... Will get their own ground, maybe at Robin Park, and all there's the sort of the the rumours, or the I don't know if it's a, official that we're going to trying to move their um, offices from Central Park to Robin Park. Do you think that could be developed into a smaller yeah. ground? Yeah, we're going to move their offices and the training facilities eventually, maybe to Robin Park or some training facilities for the younger players. Something's going on with Robin Park. We we know that much, but we just don't know the the details of it. Um, there's been no outline planning permission for the site at Oral. Um, so we don't know what's going to happen to that, whether we're going to retain it for reserve games, 19s games, etc. In terms of Wigan having their own ground, no, I, I'd love it as well. I think the DW yeah. Stadium can be too big at times, a bit sterile at times. You go to these other grounds and it just feels more homely. Um, yeah. I'd, I, I, in an ideal world, I'd love Warriors to have their own stadium, a smaller stadium, maybe 17,000. Um, but I can't see it happening. Uh, uh, for the last 10 years that I've known Ian Lennigan, he's, he's always been content with the relationship he had, this, uh, being stable mates with Wigan Athletic. I know there's been teething problems, and you can probably expect that from cup games, playoff games, yeah. even bad weather this time of year. They're going to Australia to avoid that problem this year, I see. But he, despite all of that, and despite the, the you know, fixtures changes and the rest of it, Wigan Warriors and, and Ian Lennigan have always been quite happy with this relationship we've got. And, and and I've got to say, for the most part, from what I can see, the hierarchy of both clubs get on pretty well. So I um I can't see them having their own ground, certainly not in any any time in the near future now. Um this is a completely different subject, a question from John Atherton. Um Phil, if you could add any player to the current Wigan squad from another Super League side, who would it be? It's a good question. It's a good question because it's a tough one because I'm I'm inclined to go with my favorite. Do you go with your favorite players in Super League or do you go with, with what you think we can are lacking? You know, because I've got yeah. some good. You know, there's some. I've ever some terrific players in Super League. I'm a huge Jermaine McGilbert fan. Ben Curry. I think Ben Murdoch and Silla would be good at Warrington this year. Two good back rowers there. I, but I wouldn't say we can need a back rower. I don't think we need a winger. Um, I'll tell you what I like. Who I think would be good at Wigan. That. Um, Huddersfield prop, that's Sebastian Ikehifu. Yeah, the one that you can't yeah. pronounce is yeah. yeah, the guy, yeah, yeah. I mean, I think he had the highest average metre gain or made the most metres of any prop last year. So it went under the radar a little bit. In terms of players that I think Wigan could sign now, uh, well, obviously not financially, but in terms of could fit into this side, he would be a player who I'd, uh, I'd like to. Yeah, yeah. I still think, yeah. even though they've got Hamlin, Navarrete in there and a few players are prop, I still think there's... There's um there's probably a rumour to get a if he could a, a high quality prop like that on board. Yeah. For what it's worth, I'd say Chris Hill. That would, he would be my. Oh, oh yeah, Chris Hill's another yeah. one. I didn't think he had a great season last year, but he um he's do, he's got enough credit in the bank, hasn't he? That he uh, yeah he, he, he would uh, he'd, he'd I mean, be a good he, fit. He's an England test forward, test prop, isn't he? He's, he sort of still did the business in um, in the World Cup. I think he would be a fantastic addition to that front row. Not that I can see it happening. Um, but I think he would he would be a great signing for Wigan. Thinking about and moving on to, to 2018, what what are your hopes? What what do you think will happen in 2018 from from a Wigan point of view um, on the field? Do you, do, you, do you think first of all top four is is a given, or do you think we'll be there or thereabouts? Yeah, I think it's a given because Wigan's chances of success are also governed by the strength of their opposition, obviously. And I, I look at the opposition, and I don't really see anyone who's looking like a threat. I mean, Leeds are the champions. You've got to look at them and say they only look weaker than they did last year. Um, yeah. Castleford, can they back up and do it again? Have as much good fortune as they did with the injuries again? I'm not convinced. Well, FC look similar, but they're probably weaker with a loss of Fanua. Warrington are a difficult one to call with a new coach and a few new signings. You'd expect them to be up there, but 
I, I think from, from Wigan's point of view, you'd expect, I, I can't see them not having a good year. I mean, they're spending more on the salary cap than anyone else. We've got a really yeah. well assembled squad. The doubts, of course, are if they go through what they went through last year in terms of the, the injuries they have. Um, they can't have that much bad luck again. They surely can't. And and if, if everything, that, all the words that have been coming out of a pre-season camp from the players and from the changes that Sean Wayne has promised, I, I think they're I think they're on for a good season. I really do. I, I, it's yeah. funny. There seems to be a misconception from people outside of Wigan looking in, though, that they all seem to think that Wigan fans are really greedy, that, that a World Club challenge and, and a Wembley and just missing out on the top on the playoffs wasn't enough. And from most of the Wigan fans I've spoken to, that wasn't the case. It wasn't the lack of success. It was a lack of enjoyment. Yeah, you know, but, I think that's and Even Sean Wayne said, he said there was only four or five games last year he drove home really satisfied. Yeah, um, I think that's, that's, that's probably the way that it is, isn't it? It, it does yeah. from... From, from the outside again this is something that we've spoken about is it looks like we're, we're spoiled as Wigan fans and we are you know we are spoiled with the success that we've had in, in, the t- in the team that we have and the salary cap that we spend but I think that's it isn't it it was the enjoyment of games even if we were winning we weren't particularly yeah. they weren't games to remember it, and, and I'm torn in a way saying this because I understand that Sean Wayne's remit is to win a trophy every other year and, he's, and get to finals and in between and he's punching well above his weight in terms of that but yeah. he also, it almost sounds greedy expecting expecting that as well as an attractive style of play. But to be fair, he said it himself. I, I, think, it's, I think he said there's four games last year he drove home satisfied from. And I think that's probably the feeling which a lot of Wigan fans had too. I'd probably give it a few more than that, to be honest. I think yeah. I think um, the, the ending of the, the way the season finished kind of uh, gave it a bit of a, a, a sour feeling. You know, I thought there was some, you know... St Helens after Wembley um, and a couple of games just before Challenge Cup and the one after that at Hull. I thought there was some other decent games. And at the start of the year too, you know, the World Club Challenge and around that time of year. Yeah. Um, and, and the games at Warrington, the game at the Magic Weekend, which we didn't win, but it was a terrific finish. But the Challenge Cup game at Warrington, I thought there were some other good games, but not enough where you could look back on the year and say, yeah, that was an enjoyable year. I, I don't think it was. We've got some uh, comments from, from Scott. Thanks, Scott, for, for joining in. I think Scott's probably saying the complete opposite of what we're saying. He's sort of saying, get rid of the Deadwood, get rid of Joel Tompkins, and we should have kept Mickey Matt. Yeah, I, I think a lot of people would, would probably say that. I think there is this um, criticism, you know, this old boys club criticism that I that think is either fairly or unfairly thrown at Sean Wayne and, and, and the club about signing and re-signing old players. Um, but Scott's question is, um, and I think this probably cuts back to a, a bit of investigative work that you had to do, Phil, about the Frank Paul New Asala signing in Newcastle and nobody knew anything about it. What do you think was behind that? Do you think, I mean, do you think Wigan should have got rid of him and or kept, you know, they kept hold of him? But where did those rumours come from, do you think? Well, I think at the end of last year, he had the option to leave. I know his name passed uh, a couple of the NRL desks and I, I just think they probably saw his salary and maybe just didn't want saw his form and didn't didn't want him. Um, and the other side is, though, you can't just, if he's got a contract for two years, you can't just bin him off. I mean, he has got that contract, you know. It's just like just like you can't, if we're up in arms about Denny Solomon and walking out on a contract, then the, it works the other way, too, if the player's out of form. Yeah. But he's yeah, got that contract. Right. He's got every right to, 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 to uh, you know, to stay. And I think that was more, more of the case. It was a very bizarre one, wasn't it, with that, uh, that lower league Newcastle club claiming to have signed yeah. him. I spent all morning on the phone trying to get to the bottom of that one. Uh, I actually thought he went okay at Lee as well. Um, yeah, he made some, you know, his contact looked really good. And, you know, having a, a guy the size of Frank Paul Newsala with a point to prove is not a bad thing, is it? Hey, any, anyone who's got a nickname a wrecking ball gets my vote of confidence. <laughs> no, but I, as I said before, though, my problem with Frank was he played every single game and he wasn't in form. And I think... You've got to look at that and say, well, that, that's just wrong, isn't it? You know what I mean? And, and it probably just illustrates the circumstances they had at the time in terms of available props. But if you're going to have... I mean, we're going to have three or four good quality wingers and you can only pick two. And yet, if you're a prop forward, you get a game. It just doesn't... I think, I think with Ben Flo back and the two players we mentioned before, I think that will be addressed. If Nuresal is not playing well at the start of this year, he just won't play. And that's yeah. what 
we need. And I think, it, to be honest, it's probably what Frank Bond and Masala needs as well. Yeah, I think you know, there's that challenge for him this year that, that just wasn't there last year. But before I let you go, Phil, I'm going to sort of um, ask you two questions. Um, obviously, you were the ghostwriter for Adrian Morley's autobiography. Um, which is also still available if you wanted to plug that. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I've capped out on commission now, so I'm not bothered about that. <laughs> right, yeah. If you could um, pick maybe any player that, that you would like to read an autobiography for who, who doesn't have an autobiography out at the moment, who, who would it be? Who would you pick? What, to, to ghostwrite it? To ghostwrite, yeah. Well, after I did Terry Newton's, um, I made a list of about I think of players who I would do if I got asked to to to, to do a book and and Adrian Morley was on a short list of about three players with people like uh, I thought Brian Carnies would have been a good book I've always thought Carnies yeah. would have been yeah yeah um obviously we've moved on now I mean Morley's book's been out I think four years so I, I don't know I mean you have to say profile wise Sam Tompkins is the only one who looks like he's the next in line yeah. who would have a book the characters like Adrian Morley are sadly too few and far between. We had so much fun doing that book because the thing about Moz is he's got so many funny stories, but he never hurts anyone else. He might get drunk and make a fool of himself and get arrested, but he never hurts anyone, you know? So that's why you can always laugh at him. And, and, and oh, it was such a good, good time doing that book. You know? It was easy to do as well because he has so many good stories. How about um, the man of the people, Anthony Gellin? How about that as an autobiography at one day? Oh, I think he'd write his own book, though, wouldn't he? He's so creative. <laughs> yeah, he'd probably have a movie, wouldn't he? Rather yeah. than... right. Do you know what? Actually, I thought a couple of years ago, Willie Mason would have been a good book. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. and and obviously, I mean, down the line in a year or two, you'd probably say Sam Burgess as well, given everything he's gone through. So uh, I thought they'd be good books. In fact, Bad I went out to Sam Burgess with... Uh, he came out on Terry Newton's launch party, and it was so funny seeing them all in the Ben Johnson, just ripping the shreds off each other, you know, Terry Newton and, uh, and Sam Burgess. It was, uh, yeah, great to see. Final question for you, Phil. Obviously, you, you know, your day-to-day job is, is being in front of the players, being in front of coaches. Is is there anybody over the past few years, um, not necessarily at the club at the moment, that you, that you've enjoyed interviewing the most, so you get you know, the, the most enjoyment from over the past however many years it's been? Uh, honestly, they're usually all brilliant. I, I've never had any problems with any of them. I almost admire the ones who... I, no, I do admire the ones who, if they've got a problem with you or something you've written, they'll come and tell you yeah uh, a couple about two or three years ago sean wayne let me sit in on a video review after we'd lost to st helens and the way they ripped each other to shreds was just eye-opening and what that taught me was they don't mind you criticizing the performance because whatever you say they'll be saying a lot worse you know it, but i think if it gets personal criticizing the form or criticizing um, how much we're trying i think that's probably where it crosses yeah. the line where, where, where they don't like it but in terms of you saying that you know, Tom Davis didn't have a good game. You know, Dan Sargerson didn't have a good game on Saturday. It's nothing that he's or Sunday, sorry, it's nothing that he's not saying himself. It's nothing that, yeah, that you're yeah. saying those rooms. Um but in terms of I've never had anyone fall out with me about stuff like that. Um no I'd love to tell you an anecdote, I'd love to tell you some players who who got the grump and stuff, but no, there's none of that. They're normally pretty good. And there's always time if we offend Frank. I'll Paul, try and upset them. This year, that is my goal. Okay, I'll try and upset one of them. So that I get just say, take Scott's comment in uh, about Frank Paul New Asylum and put that. Uh, yeah, probably not best, but <laughs> uh, we might not see you again. Uh, Phil, thank you so much for, for joining me tonight. This is obviously a new venture for us, and, and I really appreciate your support and um, and getting a, a bit of an insight into the club. And um, that that's unique, really, in terms of being being a journalist that obviously has access and, and you know deep rooted affiliations with the club and it's much appreciated to, to tap into that knowledge and I'm sure at some point over the 2018 season we'll, we'll be speaking again and then you know, trying to pick your brains on on anything that, that may or may not happen in, in the next year but um, we'll, we'll finish it there Phil but thank you so much for, for taking the time out of your evening. Not a problem anytime and all the best with this venture as well I think it's great. Perfect thanks a lot Phil see you later. Cheers.